in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to jump in this morning. We have been talking about wonder and we're going to finalize uh, this little Advent season next Sunday just kind of going there again together. How many of you know that it's so important to never lose our wonder for God? I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about some gathering. I'm talking about us never losing outside of these, these meetings, in our homes, by ourselves, never losing the wonder of God in our hearts. The wonder of God. I love this definition of wonder. It is to marvel, to marvel. A cause of astonishment and admiration for God. Come on, that's what we live and we move and we have our very being to do is to stay in the place of wonder, to marvel, to never lose our astonishment of the mystery and beauty of God. This is our purpose in life. Paul talks about it all throughout the book of Romans. He says, man, it, it's, it's in him that we move and we live and you know, Corinthians and other places that and have our very being. And he said, man, we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice of worship because of our wonder and amazement that we have towards him. Listen, everything in this world system is out to steal from you the wonder that God wants you to have in your heart. And it's working in a plethora of ways. Jesus said, to the church, if you remember these statements, I don't have a scripture, you can look it up for yourself, but he said, he said, body of Christ, he said, don't allow the leaven, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod to influence you. See, in a political spirit and in a religious spirit, and especially when those things are combined together, all they are meant to do is to bring death over the human heart and decrease our capacity to even have the ability to have awe and wonder and inspiration to God. Right? But the Christmas story, if we see in Luke chapter 214, we look at this last week, there's this announcement. This declaration, really, that, that was not only proclaimed over the nation of Israel at the time, but over the entire world. And it's this massive announcement. Now, it's only to a few people, some shepherds in the field, you know, some wise men that had come to visit, the, you know, Jesus at his birth. But it's glory to God in the highest. We can see this there. Glory to God in the highest. God is going to receive glory through a generation that I believe is on this earth right now. The glory of God, right? It's the glory of God in the highest. This is the announcement. This is what is, is up right now in the world. And here's the manifestation of what's gonna bring that to pass. And we're actually gonna look and just see some definition of how that's gonna take place. It says on earth, peace, and goodwill towards men. Well, we feel the conflict, right? We live in, in, in a nation and in a world where that is at war with, with, with itself. Nation against nation, man against man, man against the environment. Everything is, is swirling in these, in these realities of war within our cosmos. And yet the glory of God is going to, to produce peace and goodwill towards men. There's going to be a transactional exchange. The way things are, are going to be shifted for the better. Can I get an amen? There's going to be transformation that's going to come. In fact, you see in the Old Testament things like this where the prophets would say, why do the nations rage in vain? Why is there this chaos that, that at, the, at the end of the day, the, the swords are going to be beaten into plowshares, right? There's going to be transformation that's going to come to our world. But guess how that's going to come? 
It's going to come through you and through me. If we can't experience peace and goodwill in the midst of a chaotic world, how are we going to give that away to somebody else that has no clue that that's even a potential reality for their life if we can't overflow with our ability to carry these two things? So wonder. On earth, peace. This is the word prosperity. Come on, it's time for the church to prosper. And what I'm talking about is way more than just finances. I'm talking about prosperity of soul. Come on, where our souls are in a good space. Mind, will, and emotions align with the kingdom of heaven. That's prosperity. And Jesus says that because of astonishment and wonder, it ushers in an environment where there is prosperity, where we have peace, we have quietness, and we have rest to one soul because we have been made one with God again. Okay, i got to ask you this question. Do you understand that if you are in, in Christ, that you are at one with Him and the rest of the Godhead, Father and Holy Spirit. That you are no longer yourself. Your old self went in that grave and your resurrected self is seated with Him. How can we fully understand that to the nth degree? But here's what I want to say. You are at one with God again. There is no separation, there is no barrier, there is no distance, there is no delay for you as it relates to your ability to have prosperity of soul and walk in peace. <laughs> that right there should just open up our eyes to go, my goodness, who is this God that we serve? Who is this one who came to the planet 2,000 years ago? Come on, somebody. But it's also goodwill towards men. What does that look like? You know what that looks like? It looks like favor. So prosperity of soul and favor. You are highly favored. Do you know what that means? If God is for you, who on earth in the heavens can be against you? Do you understand that? You are favored by the Father by the creator and the sustainer of all things. And all the things that are being hurled against you, trust me, they are not coming from him. I feel this just righteous indignation of the accusation against our father that death and sickness and destruction and hardship is coming from him. It is not. All good things come down from the father of lights in whom there is no turning. He cannot be swayed. The goodness of God is your portion. Right? Favor is that kindly feeling of approval, support, benevolent interest, and concern. Do you believe God cares about your life? Do you believe he's intricately interested in every thought, every feeling that you have, everything you've been through, everything you're going through, everything you will journey through? This is who we are meant to be. This is what we're to walk in. This is the glory of God. Jesus said it in John chapter 17, verse 22, the glory you gave me, favor, honor, approval, support, benevolent interest, concern, bringing prosperity to soul through peace, quietness, and rest by being made one with God. Father, I enjoyed that with you. Now I have given it to them. Put your name in them. I've given it to Peter and around the room, I just could go around the room, Bill and Savannah, God has given it to you. You are one with God, but you know what? It's possible, and this is where we gotta dream a little bit. And when we lose our wonder, we stop dreaming and we turn introverted, and then we just get all about ourselves and we forget that we're the light of the world. Jesus came as the light of the world, but guess what? Now it's our turn to have an advent, if you will, a coming in the earth through our lives being transformed and changed and being, being the, the light in the midst of the darkness now, continuing on the work of Jesus. 
The glory that you've given me, I've given them. That they may be one just as we are. Oh my goodness, think about that. The unity that we can have with ourselves and our own hearts and with each other can be the same degree of unity that the Godhead has. Did you know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit never accuse each other? They never speak harshly to one another. They probably speak truth to one another, for sure. They definitely communicate. They're talking all the time, but they're talking in deference and preference and honor to one another, right? And they're, and, and they're doing so in such a way that there's life in their midst. You see, a religious spirit and a political spirit is out to accuse is out to listen to another voice, hear that voice, and bring accusation. I said this before, that the reason the enemy is able to go before the throne, which he doesn't have access to, only we do, according to Hebrews, is because the saints of God go there and accuse other saints. God wants peace on earth and goodwill towards men. He wants a different environment than the world has. Right? This is where he wants to take us. So this morning, I want to just take the last little bit here and take a look at probably one of the least likely candidates in the New Testament to experience the favor and prosperity of God. In all my 25 years of preaching, I actually have never even mentioned this person's name. Isn't it interesting that there'll be certain people mentioned by name in the Bible and then there's others that aren't? What's the significance of a name? Everything. Everything. Do you know heaven knows your name? And if you're walking dangerously in a good way with the Lord, hell also knows your name. Come on, somebody. Both. You're known in heaven and in hell. Good. Right? But our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We are secure in the process. And this man's name is written in the word of God and his name is Malchus. Anybody ever heard of Malchus? I had him before I even took a look into this. Malchus, who in the world is Malchus? Well, Malchus was a slave of Caiaphas. Anybody recognize that name? Yeah. Caiaphas was the high priest who was the principal religious leader who was responsible ultimately for the capture, the inquisition, and the death of Jesus. And Malchus was his slave. What has us enslaved this morning? You are to be a slave to no one or nothing except to God. Come on, let's build faith here this morning. <laughs> you are a slave to nobody. You are valuable. You are not a pawn in some, somebody's hands or some spirit dark demonic spirit's hands. You are a son or a daughter, a beautiful child of God. And Malchus is imprisoned under this religious and really political leader of the day. And we see mention of this in John chapter 18, verse 10. I just want to show you this so that you know that I'm not making this stuff up. Can I get an amen? John chapter 18, verse 10. Simon Peter, having a sword... Here's warfare, right? Manifesting through the church. The guy who is going to be the apostle that's going to give birth to New Testament Christianity. Why am I pointing that out? Listen, to take all shame and condemnation and, and stuff off of us, if God could move through Peter in a redemptive way later after this action, he can move through us. Right? I take, like, I go to Peter's stuff a lot, man. I'm like, I get it. Like, I'm impetuous like him. I say things when I shouldn't and then have to think about it later. Anybody else with me? So he takes this sword out, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the Bible records the servant's name was. Why? Because his name had value. He could have just said the servant. Just could have been some obligatory person. See, Caiaphas had a special talent in listening and hearing as reigning high priest 
in an intensely political environment, he had to be in the know because he had many enemies. Many enemies. And so he used Malchus, his slave, to be his needed ear in the city. To listen for what could be used as ammo against whoever they wanted to control in the future. say a lot about control. It is a nasty, nasty, nasty attribute in the earth. Especially through manipulation and unrighteous and actually untruthful judgment against somebody. But Malchus was out there on behalf of Caiaphas as his ear, as his slave in the city. And along comes this guy named Jesus and he's causing quite a stir in the nation. So Caiaphas is like, Malchus, you got to go figure out who this guy Jesus is and, and what, what, what we're up against here because he was getting more favor and approval and there was jealousy on behalf of the religious system because of what was happening through the life and the ministry of Jesus. Get ready, it's coming. <laughs> Church, it's not just, this is not just a story for a distant, pastful day. It's coming. There is favor and blessing that's going to be on God's people. And you know what? Unfortunately, the fruit of that's going to be jealousy and accusation. Is this too much or am I okay here? Because I'm feeling like, whoa, like, am I? Because I, I'm tracking here. Are you guys with me? Like, So Malcolm listens as Jesus shares in the temple colonnade at Solomon's porch. You ever heard of the Solomon's porch? And then there was like nearby the pool of Siloam where all you needed was a little help to get in the pool and everything could be made right again. So he's sitting there listening to the words of Jesus. Here's what I want to say. This is really important. I've just got four little things I want to put in your heart about wonder. And the first is this, wonder is found in the wisdom of God. The words of Jesus, the wisdom, the words of the Father, the wisdom of God. Have you lost your awe? Has there been any diminishment in your amazement at what Jesus has said? Times I've been there, right? We all go on those kind of ebbs and flows at times, but I'm believing, God, that there's going to be a resurgence in the church and in, in wonder as it relates to the words of Jesus and the wisdom of heaven that we get from him. He begins to talk and he says in John chapter 4, verse 6, this is Jesus, he's, and Malchus is listening, I'm the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Malchus initially thinks, man, that's really arrogant. You're saying you're the only way to God? Like, who are you to, to make that kind of declaration? What about us in the church? Who are we to, to tell the world that, that this beautiful gospel? Maybe there's all kinds of other opportunities for people, right? This is where Malchus is at. He's like, man, who is this guy? He's arrogant. What arrogance? He's moving among the crowds and his ear is open to, to a seditious comment that he can bring back to his master. They were always trying to, 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 to test and, and ultimately back in the corner Jesus. You got to look at those examples, man. They're amazing. How he was able to stay silent when he didn't, wasn't supposed to say anything. And when he did say something, how he chose his words wisely. Jesus continues, he says, come to me. All you who are weak and heavy laden. This was mentioned by, by Wilson this morning, that the spirit of the age, it's not just at Christmas, it's all the time. It heats up here because all the snowbirds come down from Canada. Can I get an amen? I'm like, where in the world did this traffic come from? And they're all going 100 miles an hour and cutting people off. Lord, please deliver me, right?
I will give you rest. In fact, if you take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I, he says, I am gentle and humble in heart, you'll find rest for your souls. You'll have access to wondering. Strange, thinks Malchus, how does this perceived arrogance man persona align to gentleness and meekness? What is this? Who is this man? The humility of God, can you imagine? I don't think we have any understanding of how humble God is, how meek God is, how merciful God is. So wonder, my friends, point two is that we should should be found in the meekness of God. Do you know what meekness is? Meekness is power restrained. Power held back. Power not leveraged. He came as a lamb, but trust me, he is coming back as a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah and power will be leveraged on the earth in a beautiful way. Malchus sees arrogance every day in, in lives up close and personal in this political and religious environment. It's not just Caiaphas, it's so many people that are operating in this. And then Jesus begins to speak to him in Mark chapter 10, verse 42, and I'm, I'm getting close to closing this thing out. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of Gentiles lord it over them. There it is. We talk about a wrong spirit. We don't lord anything over other people. Jesus never came with an agenda in his love. In fact, agape means love without an agenda. He didn't even come to save you. He came to love you. And his love is so powerful that you can't help but getting saved when you encounter it. When you taste of it for real and that thing clicks in your mind and those lies are brought down out of that stronghold of ungodly belief thinking and then all of a sudden it gets through to your heart, you're like, where else, like Peter said, where else can I go to find words of eternal life but from you? They lord it over you. They exercise their authority over you. A political spirit, a religious spirit does that. It's here to leverage over you and turn you into a slave that you were never meant to be. Not so with you, Jesus continues in verse 43 through 45. He says, instead, whoever wants to become great, we're destined for greatness. Can I get an amen? amen. Should be, we should be all feeling that. I, I'm, I'm, in fact, wake up in the morning and say over yourself, I'm destined to live a great life. Wake up, look yourself in the mirror and say, I am destined. That's not arrogance. That's not presumption. In fact, arrogance and pres or what's the word here? Where you, where you, men, you, you, you act like you're not somebody. That's the worst thing to be. Take on your true ownership of who you really are, right? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must become your servant. Minds were blown when he took up the basin and the towel and began to wash feet that were totally encompassed by the dirt and filth of this world. Can you imagine? This was the integrity of heaven. This is the glory of God. We, it's never thought about by, by getting on our knees and taking someone's feet and washing them in the purity of water. We think it's being some big superstar. No, that's not how the kingdom of God works. Most of heaven's heroes, the world doesn't even know their names right now. Do you understand that? And whoever wants to be first, now listen, look at this language. As he knows Malchus is in the crowd must be a, is it up there? Come on, say it with me. Must be a, what? A different kind of slavery? This is heavy, right? This is good, right? <laughs> can you imagine, he, he's a slave. He, God is trying to relate to him so he can get it. You understand that whatever Caiaphas has for you to do, you're going to do because you're a slave to him. 
But in my kingdom, as you become a servant of mine, you're going to be actually moved with so much love that you're going to become a slave of all. And you're going to have such prosperity. You're not going to be like a burnt out slave. Come on, somebody. Burned out church volunteer. Got to take a, a break from church for a little while. You know? That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking a, a, a slave of all, a servant of all. Because you're whole and soul. You're good with yourself. You know when to go and when to stop. You know when to say yes and when to say no. You're not in this for man or woman pleasing. You're doing it because God told you to do it. You're not going to be manipulated and moved by the mob. You're going to go and act on what you see the Father doing and what you hear the Father saying, and that's going to be your MO. And then he relates this to himself in verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give, here it is, his life as a ransom. Remember when I was going to Colombia for the first time was where my son-in-law was. I heard all these rumors about, you know, kidnappings in Colombia. And this, you know, this thought, I was like, man, what if I go down there and I get kidnapped? I need somebody with a big ransom that's going to get me out of this mess. You know what I mean? Well, think about Jesus. Like, Every single, you know, thing that's needed to get us out of our situation, he has in his possession. This is important for you as we close this up. Whatever you need to get out of your situation, he has. He is not devoid of what your heart needs to get out of the situation that you're in. He has a ransom for you that he paid on that beautiful cross. Do you understand when he went to that cross, he took upon every sin, every sickness, every disease, every ill that is being caused in humanity, and he took it right down to the pits of hell where it stays to this day, and he resurrected himself right up out of that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he holds within his hands keys to unlock doors and to lock doors your ransom for what you need to get into your hope-filled tomorrow. As the band comes back up. <laughs> so Malchus is like, what? This guy that like gave his life to others? So different from Caiaphas who's all about position and prominence. The generosity of Jesus to humanity should cause some wonder in our hearts. Because wonder, point three, is found in the sacrificial love of God. If we can't ooh and awe over that, what do we have to ooh and awe about? Jesus concludes, Luke 9, 19.10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Malchus is like, am I lost? But see, over time, Malchus, he kind of, you know, we do this ourselves. We default to that kind of that old nature that, that has been put to death, and we kind of get back into the mode because it's all we've ever known. Right? And so he begins to kind of take recognition of the followers of Jesus and, and, he's, and he's discerning enough that he sees some ambivalence written over the heart of this man by the name of Judas. So he befriends Judas. And he arranges with Judas this secret meeting with Caiaphas to get some more information. What's this guy doing? You know, Judas, there's, there's some beautiful interpretation of his life that, that looks at it through a little bit different lens. I just think, you know, we can't hear rightly. Sometimes we start listening to our own voice. And they just couldn't understand what Jesus was up to. They all thought he was going to be this political leader instead of a servant that was going to suffer and give his life for the entire world. 
So like Judas, we often try to take things into our own hands. Right? We try to, we try to take control of the situation and, and, and do better than Jesus would do because we're like, well, the, the, your way is just really not working right now. So I'm sure Judas was like, we got to do something here, you know. I, maybe he didn't even want him to die. I think he was so ashamed of actually going up and giving him that kiss to, to confirm to the soldiers that it was actually him. That he went and took his own life. Death came to him, which was not his portion. Have some, have some mercy. Look at Judas in a little bit different way. He, he, he did what we all do. He just took it really far, right? But now's the night. The evening of Passover, Malchus goes on this hush-hush mission to bring these soldiers to take Jesus, and they move into the Garden of Gethsemane. Torches, eerily dancing shadows among the gnarled olive trees, and Malchus hears the voice of the soldiers ring out. Are you Jesus? And Jesus is like, who are you seeking? And he says, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replies, I am he. Judas kisses Jesus to confirm his identity. Peter cuts off his ear. I'm just wrapping this up. I want you just to sit with this for just a minute. The one who could have been a safe place to this person then was listening to the wrong voice. He cuts his ear. But look at the response of Jesus. His blood is pouring down out of Malchus's head all over his cloak and down his entire body. Have you ever had, have you ever lost a lot of blood? You feel like, you know, like everything's kind of, you know, that's where he was at. So he kind of lost maybe track of what was even going on in the moment. And then he feels this southern, su I'm, I'm sorry, this sudden warmth. When we're bleeding out, Jesus is right there and he feels this southern or sudden warmth. I don't know why I'm saying southern. I must be thinking of my wife, <laughs> who, by the way, is having ear surgery tomorrow. Really, that's why she's not here. She couldn't be around people today because she's having restoration of, of hearing in her right ear. Is it, come on, there's something on that. I was thinking about that earlier. I'm like, okay, there's, I'm preaching on this message, ear being cut off. My wife is having her, her hearing restored tomorrow morning miraculously by getting a prosthetic put in her ear. That's not just for her, that's for the entire church. As Malchus looks, as Malchus looks up, he sees Jesus kneeling before him. His right hand covering the wound of his right ear. If you look in the Old Testament, it's really crazy. There's this moment where communion is taking place and they're to anoint their toe and their ear, their right ear. It's really, I don't understand. I'm gonna dive into that a little bit, but there's something about the right ear. And he's there and Jesus looks at him and says, as we close today, he says, you're gonna be all right. This is really wild. And this is very real. He reaches up and his ear is completely restored. In fact, when he goes home to wash the blood out of his stained, uh, blood stained cloak, he looks in the mirror and the only thing that would even cause him to know was that even real was the blood that was all over him because his ear is 100% restored. just to have a little awe in this room for God. Glory, join with me. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. 
Megan, could you sing that just again? Do you hear? Just, just so we can just get this in our hearts, because this is our portion today. All the other voices being drowned out right now. Do you see what I see? A child, a child. Do you see what I a child. See? Can you imagine that? A child. Vulnerable. Vulnerable to all that the world had to dish out over him, and yet God protected the Son of God. Close out this time and you can maintain uh, your, your presence in this place as long as you need to. We'll have parents go get their kids, but the Lord wants you to kind of push out from the shore and get into the deep end. Shore is great, but that's where you can kind of control your circumstances a little bit. Get out in the deep end and let the Father meet you there today. And let wonder come again. Let those voices be drowned out. Let's th let those thoughts be put to death. Because today is your day to have a moment with God that could change your life and position you to change the lives of others. Because as we peer into the transformation story of Malchus, may we experience our own. As we think about the transformation of Peter, may we experience our own. Lord, we love you. We love you. God bless you guys. We will see you next Sunday. Take as much time as you need this morning just to be before the Lord. And then we'll...